today we love our final look at uh, failure and our faith, and um, I'm sure everyone's just a little excited to stop talking about failure, but there are, there are moments in our lives where failure seems to overwhelm us, but we've learned from these stories that we've been looking at that nothing, no failure is too great for God's forgiveness. Oftentimes we see these small failures as our, in our lives almost as bigger than they are. We turn them into something bigger than they really are. Turning simple failure into sin or life-ending mistakes. But not all failure is sin, and any failure is a way to learn and grow. Our scripture today is the story of Saul of Tarsus, his transformation into Paul the Apostle. This is from the book of Acts. We're going to look into some in chapter 7, a little bit in 8, and then uh, skip to 9, so we're kind of moving through a big part of the story. So this is from chap- the end of chapter 7 and the very beginning of 8. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against Stephen. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him, and the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died, and Saul approved of their killing of him. That day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. And then at chapter 9, Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now he was going along and approaching Damascus. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So we start with the, the story of Stephen. Um, he's the, the first martyr of the early church. Uh, if you know anything about uh, history, uh, church history especially, um, the early church, had a, there was a lot of persecution. Uh, at this point, it was mostly um, coming from Jerusalem. Eventually, Rome took over um, Nero and blaming the burning of Rome on the Christians. and the Well, it just went on for a couple centuries like that. But Stephen is uh, a character in the book of Acts. He was, he's not really connected with uh, the church before Acts. He's not really connected. We don't hear of him until um, this point. Uh, he was called forth as a deacon in the church to uh, serve and distribute f- food. Basically, the, the early church was focused on food in a lot of ways, um, making sure that people uh, ate, that they're Basic needs were taken care of, and their work was distracting um, the disciples from doing the work of spreading the good news of Christ. And so the deacons were called up um, to do the, the work of caring, to do the work of feeding, basically, uh, from the different groups within the church. Some of the widows were getting fed, and some of them were not. And so suddenly um, they needed somebody to take care of that, and the apostles were standing there going, but I'm out preaching all day, so somebody else has to do it. And so a group of people stood up and said that they would do it, Stephen being foremost among them. He excelled at this. He was a a Christ follower, and as our scripture shows, he died as a Christ follower. Um, He died in prayer and forgiveness in a very similar way to Jesus giving, praying, forgiving at the end of the Gospels. Saul, on the other hand, now, Saul is the other character we're talking about today. Saul is, uh, isn't showing up so nice and rosy. He shows up for the first time at Stephen's death, holding everyone's coats. Um, just hanging out and watching over the coats. It tells me this is, the first time, this is the first time we hear about him. It tells me this is the first time he's really come out into public. 
at this. And um, the scripture is hard to hear. The scripture telling about the stoning of Stephen and the followers. And these, these are people who followed God. This is our, uh, the followers of God who murdered another in such a brutal way. And it'd be easy to read this with thinking back, okay, so this is a brutal time period, um, and it, it was violent, that humanity's gotten better at this, um, but the spectacle of human or of uh, public execution is, well, throughout all of history, and we still do it today, rather sudden and violent through a mob in the sense of lynching or beating someone, or through the slow, methodical process of a death penalty. Public execution is... It's been a tr- tool of crowds for all of humanity's history, and humanity eats it up. So Saul agrees with these actions. He agrees with the, the stoning of Stephen, and in, in chapter 9, he's kind of progressed. He's taken a stronger leadership role. Um, there's another translation of, of chapter 9, verse 1, where he states that it states that Saul is spewing murder. This is an even stronger phrase. Not just speaking hatred and talking about murder, but spewing murder. It's a visceral image. It's like he's holding, I, I mean, I hear those words and I think of him like holding that back dogs that are foaming at the mouth kind of thing. This, this, is, um, this is the image I get in my head. He's leading a group of people. He's, so this is the, the Saul that's leading a group of people to Damascus. He's trying to find the, the followers of Christ to imprison them. This, this is a, not just a low point in his life. This is, this is extremely bullheaded uh, hatred. And I have to laugh because I'm not a fisher. I'm not, I don't fish. Um, and so when I, heard, when I said bullheaded this week, I thought, you know, like a bull and how stubborn they are. And uh, we have a, a bullhead. Um, but it's a funny image, so we'll go with it. But Saul's hatred is not just directed at these people, and he doesn't know, realize it yet, but his hatred is directed at God. The God he loved, and the God he, he, he didn't even know that he was hurting God. And Saul's hatred, his, the nature of his failure, is important because it's something we all fall into. Not necessarily the foaming at the mouth anger, that leads to stoning another human being, but the, the self-righteous anger that we get that never entertains that we're wrong. The idea that we might be wrong at, about something. Uh, Humanity is particularly good at assuming we're always right. Um, and, and assuming that, that we know how God would act. It, of course God might not, might not use others in ways that don't make sense to me, that's something that's really difficult for us to understand. You've heard me say that the easiest way to make me angry is to see someone using God or using Christianity to kind of spew some kind of hatred. And this is something that is kind of central to my uh, personality. But at the same time, it's something that makes me angry to the point that I don't listen to people. And I probably fall into this little cycle of anger and hatred that... Uh, is really unhealthy and uh, is definitely not of God. I don't always hear or think. It's, it's the kind of angry that, um, yes, it's important to call out someone's sin, but it can easily turn me into that same person spewing hatred. Uh, so Saul is ready for murder. And this is when God steps in. God speaks up and steps in, giving Saul the chance to change. It's the right one. Saul doesn't stop to talk with God, but simply follows the path laid out for him. I call this bullheaded failure. Failure and sin based in refusing to think, refusing to reevaluate. The church as a whole is notorious for this. Um, Sticking with something simply because we've always done it that way. That's the, the phrase you always hear. Oh, we've always done it that way. We can't change that because that's, that's something that's always been around. Or oppositely, the church can get uh, a little bullheaded, changing something simply because we like change. Simply getting rid of something because it's been around for a while. So if it's old, it doesn't matter anymore. So you have tradition that gets stuck and, and, and doesn't get helpful because 
it's tradition and we stick with it, or on the other hand, we get rid of all tradition even if it's good. God gave us the abilities to stop and open our eyes and to see our own sin as individuals or to see ways that a group, as a group we might be sinning. We always want to identify with the early church, but uh, the modern church in this story is definitely not the underdogs of early Christianity. We are um, most likely most connected with the power and the uh, lasting tradition of Saul's crackdown uh, in this story. Those early Christians were promoting a change that scared people, and so the response was swift, violent, and widespread. Saul's transformation shows us that regardless of how bullheaded we can be in our own prejudice, our own sin, God gives us chances for change. So uh, for those of you who are part new to this service, uh, this is the time in our service where we spend time in discussion. There are lots of different ways to be in discussion. You can sit by yourself and not talk to anybody. Um, that is a time of discussion with yourself. There are... Uh, Spaces for notes on the announcement sheet you were given. Uh, the back of the contact cards are blank. You can write on those. My cell phone number is on the screens. If you don't want to talk to anybody, but you have an idea, you can text it to me. Um, and then when we have a wider discussion, uh, I will have that. Otherwise, you can talk to the people around you. If you don't know somebody, introduce yourself. Um, and I'll be wandering around for a little while. And we'll give ourselves about five minutes of discussion time, then we'll come back together uh, and, and talk for a little while until the kids come back up for their uh, singing this morning. So our two questions that I want you to think about, they're going to be on the screen. I wanted you to talk about a time in your life where um, you or a group or a church or something you were a part of used tradition or, on the other hand, change for change's sake um, in a sinful way, like the way we're, the way what, that led Paul to such violence. And the second question, I, in what ways do you think Paul learned from his failure and his sin? And can we do that? So these are your questions. Um, I'll be walking around. We'll give you about five minutes. I think that con having the conversation uh, that I noticed most was about change and the, the difficulty of uh, change is kind of scary sometimes, but then sometimes it's unhelpful and sometimes it's helpful in learning to uh, be okay with failure in making changes. Uh, that's a hard one uh, for all of us. We don't want to make a change that might we might have to go back on. We might have to cha uh, change again. We want as stable of everything as we can get. Uh, and I think that that's a big part of who we are. I can't stop laughing at the fish. <laughs> It's pretty bad. If you don't notice, he wrote Saul underneath it because Saul is now a fish, um, which is all right. So, I mean, the hard thing for, for Paul was in this moment he had to, Saul is Paul, if I am using both of those interchangeably, sorry about that. But uh, the hard thing is realizing that he, not only he was he wrong, but he was wrong in such a, way that was so deep to who he was because he thought he was he thought he was doing something good for God and God steps in and says this isn't right this isn't good this isn't you are hurting people in my name and that's sinful and so for Paul he used that kind of bullheaded energy that had him in violence he used it for God's actual plan <laughs> afterwards and he started to tell the story of Christ and started to tell his story in this moment. And his energy that had been so violent before suddenly turned into something um, compassionate and, uh, and, and beautiful. And he never stopped talking. We've talked about Paul. He never stops talking. He never stops telling his story. He, ne he, he can't spend five minutes with you without talking about Jesus. And so that's, that's who he becomes. Um, so he uses that part of him that ended up being sinful to begin with, but then uses it for good. And what a beautiful thing that can be. Um, and so that second question about how did, how did Paul learn from his failure? Well, he turned it around and he, he used his failure to figure out how best to follow God. 
And so that's something that we all can do as Christians and really as humans in all of parts of our lives. We use those things that, that we kind of fail at and we learn from them and then we learn how to connect them forward and to move them forward in life. Thank you.